Were you brushing your teeth this morning? Someone was raped. By the time you finished your breakfast, five more people were sexually assaulted. Every 73 seconds, a sexual assault takes place. And over 65% of people in the United States are victims of rape, sexual assault, harassment, or another form of sexual violence. I became part of that 65% at just eight years old, for I even knew what the words rape meant. The abuse continued for years. My mind tried to protect me by burying the memories. In college, I was roofied and raped again. Suddenly, the memories came back like a tsunami. A lifetime of enduring sexual violence flooded my mind and swallowed me whole. Why am I sharing this with you? To demand your attention. I am using my pain as building blocks for a platform to tell you one thing. We must prevent sexual violence. The image of a survivor is often someone who is crying and distraught, and I certainly fit that bill for a long time. I was terrified. I was obsessed with preventing this from happening again. How could I protect myself? Even more glaring than the terror was anger. This never should have happened. Why hadn't it been prevented? And what was preventing it from happening to others? I became obsessed with preventing this from happening to myself and others. For over six years, I worked for the top organizations in the field of sexual violence. Our work included advocating for survivors' rights, accompanying them to the hospital, and providing counseling and other services. Although important, I realized that we weren't answering my question, how to prevent sexual violence. All of our programs and services focused on helping survivors. Even if we help every survivor today, there will still be survivors in need of help tomorrow. We need to prevent people from becoming survivors in the first place. So let's talk about drunk driving. I promise that this will be connected. In the early 1980s, drunk driving was at an all-time high, with over 20,000 deaths per year and thousands more life-altering injuries. This spurred action. In 1980, Mothers Against Drunk Driving was formed, and in 1983, the Department of Transportation began the Drunk Driving Prevention Campaign. In 1988, the Center for Health Communication launched the Designated Driver Campaign. I'm sure you remember their programs. They had PSAs like Friends Don't Let Friends Drive Drunk and education programs in schools. And designated drivers were encouraged. Overall, there was a huge cultural shift to prevent drunk driving. And it was successful. Since 1982, when record keeping began, there's been a 65% decrease in drunk driving. This has saved over 500,000 lives. Now imagine that instead of launching a prevention strategy, they only focused on victims. When someone was hurt or killed by a drunk driver, investigators would investigate their claims and therapists would help them heal. Would this strategy have saved half a million lives? No. Investigators and therapists are certainly important, but they don't prevent drunk driving. The victim is already hurt, or worse, dead. So why is this our current approach to sexual violence? Providing the support, to, support to a victims is essential but it is not a strategy for prevention. I speak on behalf of all survivors when I say, even if I was offered the best support services, I would still prefer my rape was prevented in the first place. Sexual violence is life altering. No matter how much support I receive, I will never fully recover. There is no earthly justice for the harm I have endured. Prevention is the only option. As I said, in college, I was roofied and raped. I tried to report to the police, but the officer said, you were probably too drunk. What were you doing out at a club that late anyways? And what do you want me to do about it now? I have great news. According to that officer, we all have the power to prevent sexual violence. As long as we don't dress slutty, don't party, don't drink, don't do drugs, don't use Tinder, don't date, don't trust the wrong people, don't stay out too late, don't talk to strangers, the standards are purposefully impossible. They're designed to blame survivors for sexual violence. I met all these standards at the age of eight, and yet I was still raped. Victim blaming has two sources. The first is fear. People are terrified of sexual violence. It is comforting to think that we can prevent sexual violence by simply wearing the right clothes or taking a self-defense class. But the scary part is we can't. The second source of victim blaming is cyclical to the existence of sexual violence. By blaming the victim, all responsibility for preventing sexual violence falls to them. 
This is both the result of rape culture and a component perpetuating rape culture. For those who don't know, rape culture is a society or environment whose prevailing social attitudes and actions normalize sexual violence. It starts with the normalization, such as locker room talk, and escalates to victim blaming and harassment and culminates with sexual assault and rape. A few years ago, I was discussing rape culture with a colleague, and they said, it's terrifying. You should take a self-defense class and carry pepper spray. They were shocked when I said that this wouldn't have worked because I was first raped as a child. But my colleague isn't alone. Many people suggest similar strategies for prevention. If it isn't self-defense classes, it's a nail polish that detects roofies, or a scrunchie that turns into a cover for your drink, or a new app that tracks your location. Some of these products are created out of fear by fellow survivors, but many are created to profit off of our terror. Regardless of intention, these strategies place all responsibility on potential victims, and in many ways, they're another form of victim blaming. These ineffective prevention strategies consist of telling potential victims to prevent sexual violence by policing what we do, how we act, who we are, or by requiring that we purchase self-defense classes or other products. We could provide self-defense classes to every person in the world. We could cancel all parties and close all clubs. We could eradicate alcohol and drugs, and sexual violence would still persist. The problem with these prevention strategies is that when society tells us to prevent sexual violence from happening to us, we're actually being told to make sure it happens to someone else. Can you imagine if we told victims of drunk driving that they should have dodged? We would never think to tell a victim of a drunk driving accident that they shouldn't have been driving so late at night. Or what if there was a self-defense driving class that taught maneuvers to avoid drunk drivers? It sounds absurd when you put it like that. So why do we do this with sexual violence? We're missing something important. Drunk driving prevention strategies didn't focus on victims. They focused on drunk drivers. So why aren't we focused on the perpetrators of sexual violence? Society has deemed perpetrators innocent by omission. When addressing sexual violence, all of our focus is on survivors. Every policy, every organization, every program, every conversation, and every prevention strategy. From self-defense to bystander intervention, the focus is on everyone but the perpetrator. Perpetrators are rarely discussed, and their decision to commit sexual violence is omitted and thereby normalized. This has led to the widespread belief that the perpetration of sexual violence is inevitable and unpreventable. Individual perpetrators are considered innocent products of rape culture, and simultaneously, rape culture is considered inescapable and unpreventable. This is fundamentally inaccurate and harmful. We must obliterate perpetrators' innocence by omission, and we must continue to support survivors, but we cannot continue to push the burden of enduring and preventing sexual violence on their backs. Our focus must turn to preventing sexual violence at the source, perpetration. Now, before discussing strategies to prevent the perpetration of sexual violence, we need to define it. Sexual violence is a broad term that encompasses rape, sexual assault, abuse, and harassment. Sexual violence is the exploitation of power, as well as a tool used to gain and maintain power, control, and oppression. Now, let's break that down. The first part, sexual violence is the result of power imbalances. Power imbalances can be on an individual, institutional, or systemic level. On an individual level, one person may use physical power over another, or one person may be sober while the other is intoxicated. On an institutional level, a professor or a teacher may exploit their power over students' grades, or a supervisor may exploit their power over an employee's career. And on a systemic level, perpetrators often specifically target undocumented immigrants because they know they will not or cannot report. Or there are high rates of sexual violence against black trans women and missing and murdered indigenous women. These are just some of many examples. And to be clear, this is a simplified framework. Most cases of sexual violence exist at the intersection of multiple individual, institutional, and systemic systems of power. Now let's break down the second part. Sexual violence is a tool used to gain and maintain power, control, and oppression. It is commonly understood that sexual violence is used to oppress women. Because of this, sexual violence is inaccurately equated to gender-based violence. Although sexual violence is often levied on the axes of gender oppression, it is also used to perpetuate power and control over other populations. For example, it was a tool used to gain and maintain systemic oppression during slavery and the Trail of Tears. Another example is the oppression of the LGBTQ population and disabled communities. 
As long as systems of power, control, and oppression continue, sexual violence will also continue. All of this is to say that sexual violence is a systemic issue. Therefore, we must prevent sexual violence systemically. This will require a large-scale, multi-prong approach to address all aspects of rape culture. What's an example of a large-scale cultural approach? Drunk driving. Let's bring that back. On an individual level, the issue with drunk driving was that people didn't think or care about the impact of their decision to drink and drive, and many were unaware of tolerance levels and the legal limit. In order to address this, strategies such as PSAs encouraged people to think and care about drunk driving, and education tactics taught tolerance levels and the legal limit. On an interpersonal level, people encouraged, enabled, or failed to address when others were contributing to drunk driving. For example, buying more shots when they knew a friend was driving themselves home. And many people didn't know how to intervene when they were a bystander to drunk driving. In order to address this, campaigns such as Friends Don't Let Friends Drive Drunk held people accountable for others. And bystander intervention training taught people to call out friends in a productive way. For example, intervening by taking someone's keys. On an institutional level, institutions had policies, programs, and practices that contributed to drunk driving. For example, bars would overserve in order to make more money. And institutions didn't educate or empower to actions such as those discussed in the previous two slides. For example, schools didn't offer bystander intervention training. In order to address this, institutions adopted policies, programs, and practices to counteract drunk driving. For example, bars created policies to ask if the patrons were driving, they would offer free soft drinks to designated drivers, and they encouraged ride sharing. And institutions educated their members. For example, schools held assemblies with car wrecks from drunk driving accidents. The media depicted drunk driving as normal, acceptable, and cool. For example, sitcoms would have characters regularly drink at the bar and drive themselves home. And many people and children consumed this media without realizing that it was contributing to drunk driving culture. In order to address this, media counteracted drunk driving. TV shows depicted designated drivers, and commercials said drink responsibly. And people critically consumed their media and monitored their children's exposure. Now, this doesn't mean that drunk driving was never included. It just means that shows portrayed the horrible reality of drunk driving. On a legislative level, policy didn't address or fund drunk driving prevention. There were no laws against overserving bar patrons, and schools, workplaces, and other institutions did not have the funding for the prevention programs that we've discussed previously. Furthermore, the government didn't perform research or fund external research. In order to prevent this, legislation addressed and funded drunk driving prevention. For example, they passed server liability laws and the government funded PSAs and other programs. Also, the government researched drunk driving internally and funded external research. Now, I want to be clear that there are many other examples of large-scale cultural shifts. I have utilized drunk driving as an analogy for this conversation, but it is one of many. For example, cigarette smoking or the ongoing campaign to curb vaping. Similar to these examples, preventing sexual violence will require a multi-pronged systemic approach. On an individual level, the issue of sexual violence is that people don't think or care about the impact of sexual violence. Many are unaware of affirmative consent or healthy relationships. In order to address this, strategies should encourage people to think and care about sexual violence with PSAs or by sharing survivor stories. And education tactics should teach about consent and healthy relationships. On an interpersonal level, people encourage, enable, and fail to address when others are contributing to rape culture, for example, by laughing at a rape joke. And many people don't know how to intervene when they are a bystander to sexual violence, for example, witnessing sexual harassment and not knowing what to do. In order to prevent this, people should be held accountable for others by simply saying this is not funny, rape is not a joke, is enough to intervene. And bystander intervention training should teach people to take action by learning how to call out friends in a productive way, or by intervening when someone is trying to sleep with someone else who is too drunk. On an institutional level, the issue is that institutions have policies, programs, and practices that contribute to rape culture. For example, the Catholic Church cover-ups, or the extreme power dynamics and code of silence in the military. Also, institutions don't educate individuals on actions they can take, such as those discussed in the previous two slides. For example, schools don't teach children about consent and healthy relationships. In order to address this, institutions must adopt policies, programs, and practices to counteract rape culture.
For example, colleges should ban relationships between staff and students, and workplaces should have a zero tolerance policy for sexual harassment. Also, institutions should educate members and empower action. For example, schools should have bystander intervention training to prevent sexual violence in schools and after graduation. Right now, the media depicts sexual violence as normal, acceptable, or cool. For example, Blurred Lines is a popular song with the chorus, I know you want it, or Fifty Shades of Grey is a book and a movie that depicts a main character who purposefully ignores the safe word. People and children consume this media without realizing it's contributing to rape culture. In order to address this, media must counteract rape culture. Sex scenes should depict affirmative consent, and shows portraying sexual violence should depict its devastating reality. And also, people should learn to critically consume their media and monitor their children. For example, researching media before consuming it, and if you're not sure if it's acceptable, listening to survivors by reading op-eds or going to social media. Legislation currently does not address or fund sexual violence prevention. Policies like Title IX and the Violence Against Women Act do not require or fund prevention programs. Thus, schools, workplaces, and other institutions cannot implement the prevention programs that we've discussed previously. Furthermore, the government doesn't perform or fund research. In order to address this, legislation must address and fund sexual violence prevention. Policies should require prevention programs in schools and other institutions. And the government should provide funding for bystander intervention, education programs, and other strategies. And lastly, the government should research sexual violence internally and fund external research. Now, the large-scale systemic change needed to prevent sexual violence may seem overwhelming. It can feel like we as individual people don't have much power, but that is not the case. How can you take an active role in preventing sexual violence? You can reflect on your beliefs, values, and actions, and you can educate yourself about affirmative consent and healthy relationships. You can also call out people when they're contributing to rape culture or intervene when sexual violence is actively happening. In order to do this effectively, I do recommend that you take a bystander intervention training. You can also advocate for your school, workplace, religious organization, or other institution to adopt practices to prevent sexual violence and to educate their members with prevention courses. You should also critically consume media and monitor your children's exposure. And you can pressure media to improve by not consuming media that perpetuates rape culture and by demanding change via letter writing and social media campaigns. And lastly, the last two strategies to advocate for change are to advocate for legislation that requires and funds sexual violence prevention and advocate for research of effective strategies. These are all strategies that you can take today to prevent sexual violence. We all have a role to play, and we must prevent sexual violence systemically.